My name is Scott Roman. I'm chair of the Public Policy Committee this year. This is Patty Jones, who's chair of the PAC. Uh, Kim Butler, who's president or CEO, or whatever the heck it is, the head person at Trek. And then Linda McMahon is over there. Wait, Linda. Yeah, okay. She's the other head of Trek. She's the real head of The professional head of Trek, right? And we have Katie O'Brien, who's our lobbyist. And what, are, what do you call yourself other than lobbyist? Public policy, policy consultant. Oh, there you go. All right, I knew there was some. Left. All right, so um, I'm going to let Travis take it from here. Thanks for being here, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, this is a briefing that's being hosted by our Trek's Public Policy Committee. Uh, we have a good turnout today. Uh, we've got a good turnout online. Uh, today, we are grateful to go ahead and have a few experts on the upcoming plan for the, um, the convention center and the Fair Park re uh, refit um, from the city of Dallas. Uh, we have Rosa Fleming, uh, who's in charge of event services for the convention center. Uh, we have Brian Llewellyn, who is the president and CEO of Fair Park First, who runs the uh, Fair Park for us. And then we have Ruben Landa, uh, WSB Architects, um, and he will be uh, helping with the presentation today. So with that, I just want to go ahead and jump right into it. Um, if you have questions and you're attending virtually, please go ahead and just add them to the chat. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, have, we'll run through the presentation, and then we will open it up for questions from, from members. Uh, thank you for joining us, and with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Rosa Fleming. I'm the Director for Convention and Event Services for the City of Dallas, and I think I've met quite a few of you before, but what we wanted to do today was update you about the KB Convention Center Master Plan all of the great things that are going on at Fair Park, and then talk a little bit about the Glamour Bill. So for those of you who are new to this or kind of as a refresher to this, with the um, master plan, it really was a four-part plan that the city engaged WFP um, through a competitive bid to design for the city. And so what that looked at was the convention center, and looking at how we could actually bring it into, um, bring it back to life so that we were not just um, a city who brought in 100 events a year, but a city that could go after those larger clientele. So technology, medical, I think as you probably all know, we, and you, you've been watching council at all, we have about $700 million of deferred maintenance on the existing and so that was the impetus for it, but not wanting to actually work in a silo, which is, I think, something that has historically been done with projects at the city. We go to the next slide. Um, we wanted to look at transportation. We've got a lot of projects that are underway or planned to come underway to Dallas. And a lot of studies that the city has already done working in partnership with your entity and a lot of others. Um, we had multimodal considerations. We had marketing and planning. So where we are right now, um, having integrated all of these plans that the city has worked on previously, is that the city council has approved um, what's called 3C West of Lamar. And so that was really out of 14 different plans and concepts that we looked at. We narrowed it down to 3C West of Lamar. In doing so, we worked with all of these partners, um, the COG, DART, Amtrak. We then looked at all the development things that were going on around us, and we looked at all the partners that were already partners with us in different efforts, but in a way to integrate those partnerships in a way to make this a truly transformational effort where we could bring in all four of those, of those concepts. And I want to kind of get a little bit a little bit ahead. If we could skip to not that slide, but the next slide. So this, this is the 3C West of Lamar concept. So when you look at the building, a lot of people assume that downtown ended at the convention center. It crosses two major streets, the building that was constructed in five phases over several decades. And you started to see a lack of consistency in the inside of the building, in the interior. There was no connectivity between each of those phases. And so you had a building that was effectively a 1950s building on one side, 
disconnected completely from a building that was built in the early 2000s. And so you started to see where we weren't competitive anymore, where we were losing clients to places like Nashville. We had never competed against them before, but they built a new convention center and they brought in all that technology. They brought in all that restaurant, all that retail opportunity. And all of a sudden we saw that, hey, you know, we've got to, we've got to do something here in Dallas. And so rather than look at it as a silo, we said, how do we transform downtown? How do we look at the land use? How do we look at the zoning? How do we look at the transportation? And really reorient what we're doing. After meeting with council, after meeting with all of our constituents, this is the concept that we came upon. This will, and we're in the advanced planning stages now, conceivably stretch over I-30, that's the plan and then begin to run along the corridor where uh, uh, Orient, where the Omni is. So we'd still be connected to the Omni. We'd still be connected to the community. We're still on the same footprint and statutorily we're calling it an expansion because we are expanding it. We're expanding the market. We're expanding our outreach and we're expanding the business. So this will basically give us just under 800,000 additional feet where we, it will solve a problem for us. One, not just in reorienting the building and open up, but in terms of the building, give us meeting rooms. If you've ever been in there, there aren't any meeting rooms. Some of the meeting rooms have the size of this. So they're not built to bring in those high-end clientele. So you bring in the food and beverage, you bring in the um, hotel stays, you bring in the things that we need to do to bring revenue into town. Next slide. So if we look right here, you'll start to see where we are going to be connecting different areas of downtown. So, and you'll see that we've taken in a larger area, we'll free up about 30 acres that we'll be doing value capture analysis on. We'll be work, we're going to be working with WSP during this advanced analysis to really work with their sub, HRNA, to really look at what kind of buildings really need to go there. Right now, we've kind of concepted some mix of retail, some mix of housing, you know, and so we know that we're going to have a tremendous amount of value captured there. We're looking at probably doing that using um, perpetual leases, those kind of things. I don't think right now that the city is uh, interested in selling property, but doing long term leases, doing collaborations with a lot of different partnerships some kind of P3 relationship is really what we're looking at. We're taking into consideration the dark station needed to be daylighted. No one really uses it now. It's underutilized. It's under what's called Hall F. And so you'll see when we'll bring that out and daylight it. We're working with the land partners, ownership partners that are around us. You know, we've got probably four major landowners. Um, we're the fifth, so five major landowners, the city and four others around the convention center who have been great partners with us. They've come to the table, they've visited with us. We've talked about the future of downtown and the future of the, of the Southern sector itself. If this is not a project that is just going to resonate in the downtown area, this is something that's going to start to see a growth model into South Dallas, where we see that connection here with the park, growth of the Cedars, we see job generation, we see connectivity. We go to the next slide. And so a lot of these are what we're looking at as we look at the area plan for it. Because one of the things that I wanna really underscore is that we're not just looking at building a building. We're not just looking at what can we do with the center, but we're really looking at creating a transformational project that is functional 365 days. So we're not just talking at those convention goers, we're talking at people who live here. What do they want to see? What do we need to bring to that area to bring more people downtown? We're connecting neighborhoods. So we're connecting downtown with South Dallas, with the Southern sector, looking at how we connect it to the zoo, looking at how we connect it to uh, properties that extend past Union Station. We're looking at a lot of different projects are going into this. So when you see it, it's not just a project where there's gonna be 
design build competition for the convention center. This is more looking at a host of projects related to transportation, how we re envision Union Station, how we connect Union Station to hotels is on the other side. How do we connect downtown to Farmer's Market? How do we connect it to um, Fair Park? How do we make all those connections and still play upon and build on the things that are already constructed downtown? The new park systems that are in play, all of the um, stuff that's going on on the north side, and then kind of the future of American Airlines Center. So really looking at a broader vision than just the actual And so right here, I want to ask Ruben if you can talk them through kind of the vision that we work with WFP for this area. So you can see right now, you can see there's a dotted line right now that it connotates the existing Mission Center uh, blueprint, if you will. And what we're doing is we're taking the entire facility that's right now in the configuration of east-west, maybe into north-south. For many years, we've had this conversation about uh, looking for ways to bring the north and south together. This is a microcosm of that by building the facility from downtown over I-30 into the Cedars and making that, that connection to create this bigger, larger uh, district, if you will. What you see is it also opens up, as, as Rose was saying, opens about 30 acres of land for future development, development of all types. And as you can see, there's some of these buildings uh, that represent some of the development programs that are actually underway, and then some potential development projects, as you can see. What you're going to see on some of the, the next uh, slides is how we're also creating a lot of green space, a pedestrian realm that will actually connect all of this development with the convention center. So it could be that 365 day uh, location that people around the city and visitors can go to. Another thing that was not mentioned is the original arena that was built over 50 years ago and T ball. Those are going to be preserved, renovated so they could be continued to be used for their purposes. And we're going to use that pedestrian realm between the arena and the convention there to create that connectivity. Then we could have that mixed use, if you will. This right here is kind of an idea of what it will look like and what our vision is. So this is our, our land map right now. We wanted to make sure that we captured land ownership in the area and begin to work with those partners. So this is representative. And it says preliminary because we always want to make sure and continually check back with our partners to make sure that we adequately capture their property or if there's been some change along the way. Um, the dash card, um, red and blue, are kind of shared relationships um, with those lands. Some of it is city owned property managed by someone else, um, et cetera. And so this is kind of looking just in the downtown area actual area with which we're working. Now, this doesn't show all of the extension into the Cedars. That emanates even further. The so Cedars is a big part of our project study because there's a lot of connectivity because of the I-30 design. And I think that Ruben can probably speak to that when we get to the transportation. This WSP is also the designer for the I-30 project. And so right here, you're talking about activating our street grid. We don't see as much walkability downtown as we would like, and particularly in this area. What you have is a lot of vacant lots right now. You have a lot of areas that for a person visiting from another city or someone who doesn't necessarily come downtown all the time, you have a lot of vacant space. Vacant space creates a perception that it's unsafe. There's really no not validity to it, but it's just the idea that, you know, sometimes you see some people hanging out, they're vacant lots, and at night, because of the way that the building um, stretches across those two major streets, it's pretty dark. And so you're scared to walk. And so one of the things that we want to do is activate these streets. How do we do that? There's a potential to stretch the streetcar so that it begins to cover the entire area. And then it's a way that we answer some of our transportation questions. It's daylighting dark. It's looking at the street grid in terms of the different plans that have always already been adopted by the city and work through with our partners, including COG, including TxDOT, and making sure that we're aligning all that with any new enhancements. You know, if there is, you know, high-speed rail coming through there, is there going to be connectivity for that? 
they're an opportunity to build a hub where we can actually consolidate all of those types of, of transportation opportunities. So that's what we're studying right now. And this is just kind of a second view. If you look at the red, if you look at that red line right there, that's showing that's the arena. The arena right now is under underutilized. If I'm looking from a sales perspective and a revenue generation perspective, we probably sell it maybe 11 times a year. So, and in terms of days, it's probably less than three weeks, right, out of an entire year. So it's underutilized for a lot of reasons. It's got a lot of mobility issues. It's got ADA issues. It's kind of antiquated inside. It needs a lot of rehab. So one of the things we'd like to answer with that facility and with the renovation of the Black Academy of, of Arts and Letters is the cultural plan. There was a need for space. There was a need for artist um, creation areas. There was a need for performance space. And so right now we're working with the Office of Arts and Culture, understanding that the facility would still remain in the convention and event services portfolio, but we would renovate that space as part of this plan and they would be able to, to use it. And so there's a visioning project going on right now. I think we've met with them probably four times in the, in the recent past and they're actually there today blocking the facility so that we can start to vision that and bring a concept forward that we can talk about. You want to talk about the connection to the project? So the, this slide right here kind of shows how we're trying to create a pedestrian bound by creating green space, which is one of the key things that we're hearing from a lot of our stakeholders. We've met with hundreds of stakeholders and one thing that they always said about the district is they want more green space, they want more of a pedestrian realm that makes it enticing for them to go there and visit even if they've been in the city and they're just visiting to do something for the day. It's not just about for our visitors that come to the city, it's for the people that live in Dallas and the region. So we're looking at connecting all of the different the parks that actually exist right now, and also connecting them to the big major parks that are happening in the Trinity, uh, the Dallas Water Commons, Harold Simmons Park. We're trying to make those connectivity, whether it's through trails or, or, or additional green space to make the connectivity. We're looking at that and working with all of the, the stakeholders that are responsible for those parks. So that's, a, that's going to be a key component to the study area portion of the master plan. So in here, it's important for us to really talk about placemaking. So Dallas is a major city. We've got great airports, and it's one of the reasons that we're able to sell the convention center so much even in the condition it is in right now. And so what we want to do is build upon that idea of branding Dallas, branding Dallas is a place where you want to come for a convention, where you want to return to as a tourist, and where the people who live here want to come and visit. And so in the concept right now, we envision a plaza next to the convention center that can be used here around. We envision connectivity to several of the projects that are going on around us, and we envision a deck park. We also envision the use of the top of the building. We've gone to a lot of other convention centers and a lot of other places where they can see their downtown and know where you are, where you leave that building, good use of your downtown landscape, you're making good use of your interior art, you're making good use of a lot of things that we haven't played upon right now. And so we wanna make sure that when people come to Dallas, come to the convention center, that they come back, and that people who live here understand that this is just not somewhere you come for a conference. It's not somewhere you bring your daughters or your sons when they're going to compete in volleyball, but it is somewhere that you can come year-round and really start to enjoy downtown. And so that is why we want to include the generation of retail, the generation of restaurants around the area, because for people who visit downtown, feels limited, it feels separated, it feels disconnected, and we want to make sure that we can actually bring all of that together. And this kind of, this slide kind of goes through, just kind of summarizes everything that we just said, but if you can kind of catch the vision of what it would look like, this is a 10 year plan, what it would look like when all of those projects start to come together, you know, to the west of the facility, to the east of the facility, and with an activated downtown. 
Now, I want to make sure to answer some questions that we always get from constituents. Pioneer Park is not going anywhere. And we are going to work with the land, um, with the commission on how to better activate and make use of Pioneer Park. It is a founder's park. Founders are buried there. We want to make sure that like other cities, like the Boston cities, where they actually connect it to the city and make it a walkable area that we do care of that. We're not moving the police memorial. And we want to make sure that that's understood as we go out and begin to talk about this project. Instead, we're going to connect it. We're going to give it a story. We're going to brand it. And we're going to make it part of the free speaking. Okay. And now we're going to talk about transportation. I think we start to get into some of that here. So we'll do that. And then we'll launch it to Fair Park after that. Okay, so uh, the Convention Center and the city area are just two parts of the pre cone approach to the master plan. The third is the transportation component. This is a critical part because a lot of people think that the convention center itself is going to be the driver of development. It's actually the transportation piece. The transportation piece is going to get people to downtown and to where they're, where they're from. So what we're looking at is developing a multimodal hub that takes advantage of all the different transportation modes that already exist in downtown and bring them together in a consolidated effort so that it makes it easier for people to access the convention center and to all the districts in downtown. So as you can see, these are all of our stakeholders and all the modes that we're looking at, high-speed rail, commuter rail, streetcar, future high-speed rail, uh, Bearport, taxi, TNC, all the different types of modes you can think about. We're looking at how we can bring all that together. And so we're looking at different modes, but right now, this is these are the, the stakeholders that we're working with. We're trying to find a way to take advantage of the existing facilities and assets that we have in downtown, and that is what we're looking at right now. So I'm gonna go right to it. This, Right here, this screen right here kind of gives you some of the options we're looking at. We're looking at options to build a, a, build a mode, a hub either in Cedars by the future high school rail station or at the actual convention center itself or at the current union station. So right now we're looking at all three. We're doing some real detailed analysis to determine what makes sense the most, what is most cost effective. Also taking into account all the development projects that are happening in downtown. We've been working with the developers throughout all of these, all the property owners throughout this entire process because we want to overlay our master plan with their plans and see what, see how we can create synergy to bring that together. And that also includes a multimodal hub. So what we're doing right now is trying to figure out how we piece that together. And as we get closer and closer to completion of the master plan in August, you're going to hear a lot more about the direction we're going to go on with the multimodal hub. Keep your eyes and ears open for that. And I think it's important to put Union Station because I think there has been some discussion at some previous meetings that we had with with uh, organization is that uh, looking at unionization in a different way. So if you've gone to Denver, you see how they actually really revived that entire city by making great use of Union Station, bringing back that historical concept to it, looking at it, turning it into a hotel. So that's the visioning exercise that we're doing right now. Um, Union Station is already a hub. I want because I, I think sometimes when we say the word hub and we say Union Station at the same time, we're like, no, don't bring any additional. But we don't want to bring anything additional. What we want to do is augment what's already there and make better use of it with the option to bring the streetcar in front of it um, so that that's one of the stopping points. You can up there, you can kind of work with Amtrak to kind of build the amount of people who are using it and then use it as a transit for people who stop at North Washington Convention Center, and then they can walk to Union Station and take the streetcar to different um, parts of downtown and into Oak Cliff. So you're starting to see that connectivity and the ability to actually bridge and build different things that are one, some are already done and already um, built and need to be marketed better and have better transportation options to them, and then kind of the future we hope that this process right here will, uh, will create great TOD transit oriented development opportunities, retail, uh, restaurants, housing, affordable housing, so that we can actually augment this entire plan. So we'll learn more about that as we move forward. And just real quick on the, the outreach, we have met with hundreds of stakeholders, I've had hundreds of meetings, and we're going to continue to do so throughout the entire process. We have met with uh, not only stakeholders that have a vested interest in this because of their location in downtown 
or the end users or the customers, but all of the advocacy organizations, chambers of commerce, you know, you name it, we've met with them. We met with 16 different um, um, departments in the city of Dallas because they all obviously have a vested interest. And we have gotten so much input. So what you see up here is a combination of everybody's input. We're developing something that's a community's project. And we're going to continue to do so. We are going to be moving forward with our next public meeting on July 14th. We're going to have, uh, we're also going to have a series of town hall meetings in all of the districts, all 14 districts. So those are going to be scheduled throughout July and August. We also have our final uh, telephonic town hall meeting on September 1st. And then we're going to have the ultimate uh, symposium and final public meeting on September 8th, which will be a hybrid meeting, both live and virtual. We're going to present the master plan in its entirety and say, here it is. This is what we're doing. Show everybody what we what we develop. It's your plan, and we look forward to everybody being part. Thank you. But oh, wait, there's more. I always get to do the value proposition here, where I come in after we talk about all the great things that are going to happen with the convention center, and talk about how we're linking that into uh, one of the second biggest drivers for uh, tourism in the city. Uh, that's of course Fair Park. Uh, much like uh, the convention center. We're a huge generator for hotel room nights, so it's very appropriate that we take advantage of this. This is a pretty unprecedented ability to make an investment in a park, by the way. Uh, there was a state law changed in the last legislative session led by Ms. West, Morgan Meyer, Jasmine Crotton, uh, and Andy Shinbun, particularly Rafael Anchia, who was the first person to introduce and build the Little Al Fair Park, the only park in the entire state of Texas to take advantage of this funding method, because we are a tremendous tourism driver. Uh, in an average year, we generate about 150,000 room nights, uh, putting a net $11.2 million into our hotel economy. Uh, but of course, we contribute tremendously beyond that. Outside of the State Fair of Texas, we have a total global impact on the uh, Dallas economy in the neighborhood of about $295 million a year. Uh, and that's because we have over 6 million visitors a year. Uh, about 42% of those come during the 24 days of the State Fair of Texas. Uh, and we're increasingly activating it. Uh, other similarities, we are both, when you look at the George Dahl Arena at the Convention Center and all of the buildings at Fair Park, uh, uniquely tied. These are historic venues. They've been part of the fabric of our community for a very long time, uh, but they also have very persistent challenges. Everything that you've heard about the Convention Center is true of all of the buildings at Fair Park. If it's raining in the city of Dallas, it's raining in the Convention Center, and it's raining at Fair Park. And I don't mean outside, I mean in the actual buildings. Uh, it's a very serious problem. Uh, in fact, when our master plan was adopted by the city of Dallas, with unanimous consent of both the Park and Recreation Board and City Council, it acknowledged $333 million of deferred maintenance in the critical category. These are projects that need to happen immediately. And when we talk about why, it's because there are not only the economic impacts, but also very prestigious events that are at risk. Uh, I think most people know that Texas OU football game is a very important thing to host in Dallas. It's sort of the last college game of its kind. It's often described as the single greatest last rivalry game in the world. And so much of that has to do with the intimacy of the Cotton Bowl. But if not improving, uh, this game could walk. And that is a fact. In fact, the athletic directors from both Texas and Oklahoma University have told us they are not willing to proceed until a master plan is put in place for that building. And so we have engaged. Truby and Overland Partners, Brian, formerly of HKS, perhaps the greatest stadium and arena designer in the world, to do a little bit of work for us. And it's in light of some other prestigious events that uh, we might be making announcements about later today. Hopefully some folks are going to be joining us in the AT&T Discovery District with our friends from Visit Dallas and the Dallas uh, Sports Commission. We have been a part of a region-wide play for World Cup 26. Uh, we anticipate a favorable announcement. Wouldn't throw a big party if we thought there's going to be a bunch of people open. So again, hopefully you guys have some time this afternoon. But I will tell you, if we get the gym that every city competes for, the International Broadcast Center, because of its tremendous economic impact, uh, but don't have the ability to improve these facilities, it will go to another market. And that is uh, not something any of us want to see. But beyond that, Fair Park's very special in and of itself. Over 6 million visitors a year today. And most people have the impression that Texas OU might be about the only thing we do. Uh, we have really focused on how to activate that facility much more aggressively. There have been a number of large-scale concerts very successfully. Uh, Coldplay recently. Chris Martin, 
lead singer Coldplay said it was the most intimate stadium he'd ever played in North America. It reminded him, I quote, of European soccer stadiums, which we love to play. Ironic that we're talking about World Cup in the same capacity. As a matter of fact, because of international soccer, last year, the Cotton Bowl, despite pandemic impacts, closed as the 37th busiest stadium in the world. Uh, it is a tremendous driver. It's also the ninth largest stadium in the U.S., and it can compete with all of the great stadiums that you might think would compete with in North Texas. But we also, when we go after these major events, are competing with NRG in Houston and uh, the Alamo Dome. Big events, if you're lucky, come to one market in a state. And we've been very lucky to be able to bring some of this business back into Dallas, capture that tax base. But what we've really focused on is making Fair Park a destination of choice. Uh, and also something that drives uh, a tremendous increase in the quality of lives of the people around us. And that creates new opportunities for private and commercial investment in real estate. And we're already seeing some of that happening. Uh, our friends at COG recently announced, for example, uh, a complete loop trail that will expand the Santa Fe Trail all the way around our border. It activates that space that separates us from our neighbors and will tie into an ambitious new 14 and a half acre community park that will be opening in 2024. But the facilities themselves must be improved. And so we have focused on some, some exciting projects, but also the basics. One, when one comes to a venue like the Cotton Bowl, you expect you might be able to uh, grab a soft drink comfortably or perhaps go to the restroom without waiting a long line. But that is a venue that is more than tripled in size. I assure you they did not triple the number of restrooms or points of sale. And so it doesn't load the way we would expect a modern stadium to. We need to make some improvements there. And there's some pretty cool ways to do that. Uh, you guys will be getting a digital copy of this. Please keep this quiet for about a week longer. We're gonna be releasing these to media next week. Um, we're gonna be restructuring some of the members, opening up some of the concourses to make it less congested, incorporating some of the art deco art you'd see around Fair Park. And that's taking a page out of George Dahl, the same designer that designed the arena at the convention center. Uh, and we ask ourselves, what would George Dahl do? using a lot of large scale art because it's fast, it's beautiful, it brightens spaces, it makes it memorable. We're gonna incorporate that into the Cotton Bowl in a way that makes it feel like it's always part of that Art Deco Disneyland that we all know and love. Um, the Coliseum has been recently reactivated with a multi-year agreement for professional women's volleyball, professional women's basketball, and a number of concerts through our partners at Live Nation. However, at a recent Live Nation event, uh, Guests that paid extra to be on the floor and be close to the fans had to walk outside in the rain because there's no floor access at all. That is not a premium experience for who you are. No matter what kind of show it is, we've been booking international rodeo competitions into this space. We're excited to bring that back. We need to make enhancements to the facility itself. Uh, here you see an exterior wall that is a real picture. We've already uh, utilizing bond funds, upgraded seating, sound, HVAC, and restrooms. But we have to tie in a better experience with some premium levels so that we can bring in more competitive events. We're simply lacking that both in the Cotton Bowl as well as in the Coliseum. There you see a new premium area that would have an unlimited view of the stage and the head of Live Nation commented at that recent relaunch uh, that it's basically a big club. It's one of the best venues he's ever seen. That's great praise from somebody that certainly knows the business of bringing concerts. And we don't see this competing with the American Airlines Center. It's simply at a different scale. And it's a scale that currently Dallas doesn't have a venue that's bringing in that tax base and activity for it. This is my favorite. Uh, the band show is a much beloved structure. You probably remember it if you visited in recent years from the bird show, because it's about the only thing you can do with this facility during the State Fair of Texas. During pandemic, arts and culture organizations, as Rosa mentioned, were looking for more performance space. The city needs more of it. I could not give this space away for free due to the deteriorated facilities. There are no restrooms in this facility at all. You actually have to walk outside to go use the restroom. There's no food and beverage, and it's exposed to the sun 92% of the year. It's got a very nice orientation to capture every bit of heat that Texas can throw at it with no shade. Um, we anticipate a shade structure being built. It is a membrane system over truss, which means that it can be internally lit at night which will give us a beautiful lighting show over the audience. It'll also give us the ability to walk some seats from the back of the venue closer to the stage, increasing the intimacy and the effectiveness. We'll put in a house sound lighting system. And the best part of this whole conversation, whether it's about the convention center or fair park, is that we're gonna be able to do all of this. No impact to your tax dollars locally. 
unless you make a habit of staying in a hotel. Because this is a tourism tax, there won't be any impact to general fund dollars. And there's a, an election. Council has yet to call for it, but we anticipate that that will happen in August, exactly when it should. And that a tremendous amount will be invested for the expansion of the convention center, but also into Fair Park. As a matter of fact, we anticipate over $300 million being generated for Fair Park, which will fill in the hole that I mentioned the council approved before as part of our master plan and give us a level playing field for the first time in our modern history. It is also not only the single largest investment in Fair Park since we were originally built in our current configuration in 1936, it is more than all monies from all sources that have been invested in Fair Park in that time. So to call this a game changer is not an overstatement. If anything, I'm, I'm burying the lead a little bit. And there's a powerful case study for why we should do it. We're going to be leveraging a mechanism called the Brimer Bill that basically adds a 2% uh, increase to our hotel occupancy taxes. It'll put us right in the middle of our comp set. We don't lose any competitive advantage by doing that. And when we look at the success before and after the American Airlines Center's construction, it's easy to see why these two projects are going to have a tremendous impact on real estate opportunities, and development opportunities around the city. And uh, before I pass this back over to Rosa for questions and closing remarks, I just want to reiterate, between these two projects, there's no impact to local taxpayers. It's a transformative opportunity for quality of life and economic growth. It's the biggest investment in the history of Fair Park. I love saying that. And it also creates vibrant downtown neighborhoods that help make a critical investment to link the north and south. We, unfortunately, in our city have a shameful difference in the quality of life and the duration of life expectancy, people who live north and south of 30. These opportunities create economic growth and build capacity in communities that sorely need it. That I'll pass it back over to uh, Rosa. Thank you. And so before we launch into questions, I wanted to kind of give you some timelines. So the city has approved a few things. So in terms of the financing, we have what's called a project financing zone. It takes in the, uh, what are called incremental hotel associated taxes. So that's your hotel occupancy tax, that's your sales tax, and that's your mixed beverage tax from the hotels that are within a three mile radius of the convention center. Low estimate is 2.2 billion over 30 years. Um, that will be able, that'll come back into Dallas. That was approved by city council and accepted by the state back um, in December of last year, we started collecting funds into that trust fund in January. Um, the Brimer bill that you referenced is a resolution was uh, put forward to city council. They approved it, we sent it to the state. They found no negative economic impact to the state based on our project. And so now we'll be going back to council August 10th asking them to call an election. So it's basically a two resolution type project. In the interim, there is a group that will be educating the public about this project um, until we get to the election. On Right now, we don't anticipate that we should have any problem in August with council uh, approving call for election. And then in terms of timeline, so we'll be finished with the master plan document and draft by 9-8. We'll brief council as we go into we're in October for that. Um, in the interim, we're working on the advanced planning for the convention center component. Council approved that on 5-11 and we immediately started work on that. We'll be done with that advanced planning, planning component in December. I mean, everything goes well with the election um, in November. We're estimated that over, over that 30 year period, that Brimer should bring in about 1.5 billion. We'll take that 2.2 estimated from the project financing zone and the 1.5 after we take out 300 million for their part. And we'll use those to sell revenue bonds for the convention center project and use those funds as security. And that security will pay down the debt and pay off the debt We'll roll in the existing debt for the convention center because I know that's a question that council has brought up. And so we've done a formula where we'll roll it all in together and we'll basically 
hotel generated taxes to pay for the project. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. One, Brian, do you, have you ever considered being in radio? <laughs> <laughs> I do get that question from time to time. Uh, but question about the renovation to the stadium at Fair Park with the potential announcement of the World Cup being hosted there. Would the vote and being ready for the 2026, would the money be from that primer bill or would that have to be funded some, some other way to be able to make those renovations? It's a great question. We're already working on bridge finance with the outgoing uh, CFO and having conversations with her. Uh, there's a great plan in place to make sure that we can mobilize as soon as the election is done. Because we have a fairly narrow window. The actual, uh, actually, the biggest priority is not the state. Stadium actually could hypothetically host uh, games. We don't anticipate finals in the Cotton Bowl. It's going to go to Jerry's World. It's going to go to the soccer Frisco and the MLS team in uh, Frisco. Uh, this was a region wide application. Uh, portions that we anticipate potentially being suitable for uh, would be things like the International Broadcast Center, so we'll activate Fair Park for a nine month stretch and give us tremendous international broadcast attention, both as a city and property. Uh, the number one priority coming out of this is actually going to be the exhibition buildings, which need to be massively renovated. Uh, we hosted the International Broadcast Center last time the World Cup was here, but I can tell you the specs of it is tenfold. Um, you're looking at either temporary and or permanent enhancements uh, to some of the buildings in terms of their size, or channels, data, redundant power, bathrooms that work, uh, a lot of basics, but it needs to be done. Uh, the real joy of that is there's irreplaceable art on the exterior of those buildings that, with no exaggeration, could fall off the wall, you know, have a proper intervention to restore the buildings. And this provides an opportunity. I had a question from online. Uh, one of our participants had said, You've read of the resignation of the president of the high speed rail. What is the status of the project as you interpret it today? How does whatever decision comes out affect? So we're not planning this project as though at, around the high speed rail. Whether the high speed rail continues forward or it does not, um, this project still going. Quick question down here. Uh, I mean, did a, you have a successful vote on November 8th? That's kind of the convention kind of the time. Development and bringing on various professional services. Sure. So we are scheduled to turn dirt June 2024. And so far, we're trending. We haven't missed any of our deadlines so far. And we've hit all of our marks. And so right now, what I'm drafting is an RFI that I'm going to um, put out probably in July to kind of list all of the Components of how we're going to move forward with the project so that project teams have plenty of time to start putting the team together. I won't issue a procurement until after, you know, until after the election. Um, I want to make sure we can move forward with the, with the convention center and certain components of it. Farmer doesn't pass, but I want to make sure that we've got the full funding and that'll tell me what I have to fully work with. Um, and so we'll get prepared for those. We'll be at a constructability review. So we'll look at what we've done from a conceptual perspective, what those cost estimates are that are put together as we work through the advanced planning component of this, and we'll have a constructability. Review. So that's one component. We will put forward a design um, procurement, and then obviously the construction will come later and a uh, project manager or owner's rep. So all of that will come into stages. I'm putting the RFI together. If you look at DallasCCMasterPlan.com, um, Ruben and his team have been great at updating the timeline of how the procurements will forward. And so you'll see that. Uh, what's that page? It's uh, this um, business opportunities page on the, the website. Opportunities uh, link. Just click on it, it takes you to everything. And so there's kind of a timeline in there of how we're going to start when we see the things. Could you just speak up? I couldn't hear you. Yeah, and, uh, if you go to the website, it's, there's a business opportunities link. You just click on it, and then it'll bring you all the information and give you the uh, 
a timeline of procurement. Where's that? Where's that business opportunity? So the website dallascmasterplan.com. Right. The page menu. Okay. You can do dallascmasterplan.com slash business dash opportunities if you want to see. Is there room because um in putting together the, the master plan, have you guys uh, also have a plan of how you're gonna you know, the disruption of the existing convention center? Because some of the footprint is the same. How are you gonna tear one down and put the other one on and still have conventions going on? That is that at the website as well? So so we're going to I'm gonna let Ruben talk through the phases, but I want to make sure that you understand one of the reasons that we selected this alternative and one of the reasons that Council saw this as the best alternative is that we can leave the existing facility up, continue to use it almost through the duration of the construction of the new facility. And so we'll you want to talk to the phasing of that? Sure. The idea is when the construction begins, if you look at the, the screen portion where it says KBHCCD on the, on the Cedar side, that portion is over the I-30 Canyon up to where the current of airport is. That portion will be constructed first. That what that allows for is the entire convention center to continue to remain in operation during that construction of that phase. Once that phase is completed, then you'll take F, uh, F, E, and D and demolish that section. You'll activate the new portion. You'll keep A, B, and C operating, but F, D, E, F will go away so they can construct the second half of the convention center. When that portion is completed, then they will decommission and tear down the rest of the convention center. And you'll have a full operating uh, center uh, to operate on. Um, that'll, I think it'll probably take two and a half to three years for the first portion to be completed, and then the the rate the doubles will be remaining with the two years for the second half. And as we work through the advanced planning and TBS design, who is the the sub of the contract with WSP that's working on the convention center, as they start to better align those phases, we'll put that on the uh, DallasCCMasterplan.com site as well. So that those phases can be um so that we'll have transparency in how we're envisioning those phases going forward. Sir, you mind going to the multi-hub slide? Sure. So there's three of them up there. Is it a potential that all three are done, or those are the three options and you're gonna do one of them? Those, yeah, those are the three options. And there is an opportunity for a dispersed hub. Everything that we do obviously has to go to city council. And so we want to give them options. So we're giving them recommended options. Obviously, it will come with the one that is the staff recommendation, but they'll obviously need to make a policy decision about whether they want to do that, or they want to do a dispersed alternative. And there is, a, there is something that uh, Foster Council for um, WSP is working on that actually looks at dispersing this should none of these fall out as an option. So you'll see disbursement kind of platforms, I guess. Is a hybrid of, it could be a hybrid of one of these three. Okay. So, it, you know, obviously when you talk about dispersing, you may not be able to bring all the most together in one specific location. You could, you, you could bring them pretty close, connected to the convention center, with the pedestrian around, it's still kind of help. Um, still bring people to bear. People will still be able to get to all the different modes pretty easily through the pedestrian road that we're also creating fills in the space between the convention center and the modes. So we have a tremendous parking problem downtown. I hung out at the Stadler a couple weeks ago and I was just it, the parking garages don't uh, sufficiently didn't even go to Neiman's and park where I always park. Um, if the guy lets you in, he figures it out. None of that's there. So I'm spoiled. <laughs> so you don't hang out because it's too much talk. So Rosa and others, what's the plan for the parking? You're gonna bring on this walk building, which I think is amazing. But how are you gonna park it? So a lot of our partners, um, the developers that are around us already have parking plans in their development plans. And then with the convention center, we're working with advanced planning, we're actually working on what that will look like. We know that we'll have a garage, we'll need to set the spaces for that, but there's already some answers being done with our partnerships that are working with us. So partner, there'll be garages. Global is yes. doing has, 
uh, parking in that. I know that Matthew Southwest, they have some parking behind them. So as we go forward and we start to look at capacity, we'll bring all those together and look at exactly that we have a solid answer for where I know your question was relative to downtown. I'll also add we've been working Exxon and crew street grid side for Fair Park. We're going to be building uh, some relatively large structures just to try to pull more of the traffic from the surrounding. I know that it's a uh, congested a parking challenge. We have traffic challenge. We have tons of spaces. We need to reconfigure them in a way that makes them more so that, uh, as you see, more. Activity. We're ahead of that curve. In fact, the uh, concept for our first garage just won an AIA award last week. We anticipate breaking ground on that uh, subject of permitting, and I'll probably get a laugh in this room. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we anticipate breaking ground on that second week. Thank you. Yes, sir. I probably should know this, but I don't. Uh, How is it working with the state fair of Texas? That organization has kind of had a lock on their all having some breakthroughs there. Uh, they have been an incredible organization to work for. Uh, the easiest way to understand our relationship to the State Fair was actually coined by Gina Norris, their outgoing chairwoman. Uh, and that was, we're North Park, they're Neiman Marcus. They are one reason people come to visit, is perhaps the marquee reason people might come to visit. Uh, but we've had a great relationship. And there have been conversations in the past about having this long, exclusive period. Um, due to a variety of reasons, the Rolling Stones ended up having moved their date a second time. But originally, they were going to play the Saturday before the fair this year. And that is how agreeable the fair has been. We have also moved in the first new four long term tenants in the park in over 22 years. There's no issues. Uh, and those organizations are thriving. The trick really comes to finding synergistic ways for organizations to thrive in the park that also benefit from the fair. See it as uh, something that's not conducive to the We all promote the uh, private development on the publicly controlled land. Will you ground lease it or will you sell it? So that's the models that we're running right now. Where we don't plan on selling it right now. That's the very last thing I want to do. I actually want to consider ground leases. To the uh, the, the tourist tax that is going to come to Fair Park. That all anticipated coming from. Hospitality operations, or does a chunk of that come from the hospitality private investment? No, this is really focused on hotel occupancy tax, and so we've anticipated a very conservative pace, not seeing a lot of new hotel development, etc. Uh, I will also tell you that uh, City Hall is not interested in development themselves; they want to trust experts in that space. Our master plan contemplates the addition of a hotel on our site as well. A similar opportunity at some point in the coming. Uh, we are somewhat accelerated in that because of what I would call potential FIFA announcements. <laughs> it's always fun to play. I know a secret for the last three hours. <laughs> Can we, whenever you're speaking, would you mind making sure that we hear on this? Sure, of course. Thank you very much. Well, what's going to be the total capacity of the convention center in terms of square footage? And so we're adding about 800,000 square feet. The bulk of that will be in meeting rooms. So where we are great right now is exhibit hall space. Well, with people who need a lot of clients who need a lot of exhibit hall space, want to bring in things like helicopters, all of that we can get into the current concept. What we do not have is flexible space. We don't have any back of house. So if you've ever done a convention there, if you've ever gone to a convention there, you see food being trucked through the middle of everybody walking. And so um, that's that's going to add square footage to the by making sure there's something that can circulate the building and kitchen space right now. The kitchen that is most used in the convention center and not used just for heating food is about the size of someone in a large home. Um, so how we generate the amount of food and beverage, I can only, I'm always thanking our chef. I'm like, I don't know how you make it happen, but you make it happen. You know, and sometimes it requires us to have the chef go cook somewhere else, put the food in. So 
So you start to see a loss of revenue from that. So you'll see um, a lot of square footage added for kitchen space. And then the biggest is, again, the, the eating room space. We are nowhere near the ratio we need to attract clients that actually um, spend the larger dollars. So we're actually having Visit Dallas and 60, formerly Spectra, now do double time and get clients in order to make, to meet our revenue numbers. And they've done it, but not without a lot of big borrow stealing and us promising everything, you know, get them to come to Dallas. And so those are the things that we want to turn around. If they actually have uh, accommodated tens of thousands of guests looking for them by using mobile kitchens and also prepping the food at their park, delivering the food from there to the convention center for events. So when you say an additional 800,000, what do I add 800,000 to to get the code? So you'd look at, and I have a, not in this presentation, but I have a, yeah, a spreadsheet that kind of tells us, for example, we're at about 50,000 square feet in eating room space, which is super small. We'll be um, adding up a little bit another another 300,000 square feet to that. We'll be adding flex space on the top of the building. So we'll be able to use that as either a ballroom and like San Diego and some other cities during, during our good weather times, not the hot months. But we'll be able to use it where people can have open air events, which is um, something that sells quite a bit. So I'll send that to the group. I've got kind of the, the breakdown split on where, the, where that square footage would be out. Is there a demand study, feasibility analysis that shows the demand for this project? And maybe okay. some anecdotes to say we lost XYZ convention to Nashville. They would love to come to Dallas, but we couldn't provide X, Y, or Z just so we can understand. Yeah, year. so I can link you to all the presentations we've done in council. So we've briefed a lot of that. I mean, we've lost tens of, tens of thousands of events because we can't accommodate their needs. The business case is huge. There was um, a study done in 2011, another one in 2019, another one in 2017, and then previous studies. Some of those they tried to answer you know, early studies going back as far as 1999 by adding space and just continually stretching the building. If you go to Hall F, you see that we tried to answer the need for, um, for more exhibit space, open air exhibit space. Um, so we had just a little bit of land left, right? That belongs to the convention center and to the city. So you have this kind of rectangular design that just fit into the space, you know? And so it didn't really answer the question the way we needed it to. And so there's a lot of wasted space outside of that exhibit hall that's unusable. And so it wasn't looking future forward. It wasn't like, how can we take orient this building or how can we do that thought wasn't put in early early um, studies that came out it was actually just let's just keep expanding the building and so we've got studies going back as far as 1999 the most recent is 2017 and that's the one that I was responding to decided to go forward and start to explore um, the concept of, of the convention center and in that exploration we you know what? We can't just do it in a silo. We did that before. That model doesn't work anymore. And so that's where we started partnering. We called in our the landowners around and like, what are you going to be doing in the next few years? And how can we segue with that? How can we make this a transformation project for, for Dallas? And so all the models now are showing that we'll be able to double the revenue that we're bringing down to the city double the number of events. We bring about 100 events to the city a year where people bring about 200. We change the kind of the dynamic and the orientation of what those look like. And that will generate um, at a low estimate of jobs, permanent and then construction. Thank you very much. Does anybody have just a burning question you have to ask? Okay, so maybe these nice people will stay just a little bit if you have a question you want to ask. Um, this isn't a voting item for this public policy committee uh, right now, at least. I just want to say on a personal basis, I am all for this. And I thank you for what you've done. There's a lot of times when 
uh, government entities make presentations and they go, oh my gosh, this is like going the wrong way. And I just think, thank you so much. This to me personally looks like it's going absolutely the right way. So I just want you to know, we appreciate all the work you've done, appreciate all that you're doing. And we, as I will speak largely for the group, anything you need us to help you with, you need manpower, you need hours, you need somebody to do something, call on track. We'll do our best to help you out with that. Um, yeah, thank you all very much. All right. We're adjourned and you can stay as long as you want.